Hello everyone and welcome back. Today I want to talk to you about a special class of two-dimensional CW complexes called surfaces. We've already encountered a couple of these in the past. For example, the sphere, the torus, and the genus 2 surface. But there is a broader class of them called non-orientable surfaces, which have all sorts of bizarre properties. For example, uh, RP2 is one example of this, and the Klein bo bottle, which you can see here, is another example. So keep in mind, last time that we learned how to calculate the fundamental group of a two-dimensional CW complex. So let's get to it. So surfaces are a special class of two-dimensional CW complexes. What they are is uh, finite CW complexes, uh, which are two-dimensional, and they have this uh, most important property, which is that they are locally homeomorphic to R2. So, for example, the sphere here, if I take any point on the sphere, I could look at a little neighborhood around that, and this is homeomorphic to R2. And similarly, if I take my genus 2 surface here, and I look at an arbitrary point, this 2 is locally homeomorphic to R2. So here's a non-example. This is a, a finite two-dimensional CW complex. Both of these disks are filled in. But this point here is a problem point. Uh, the it has no neighborhood homeomorphic to R2. And one way you can see that is any neighborhood of that point must obviously contain that point. And if I remove that point from that neighborhood, I get something disconnected. Whereas if I ever remove a point from R2, the result is always still connected. I should also mention that surfaces are an example of what's called a manifold. These are, I'm not going to exactly define what these are, you could look them up, but uh, they're second countable Hausdorff spaces which are locally homeomorphic to R2. And they're an important class of topological spaces. So there's an important operation on surfaces called the connected sum. Uh, and it's denoted with a little hashtag. So each point has a neighborhood locally home each point has a neighborhood homeomorphic to R2. So if I cut out two of these neighborhoods, I can glue the resulting pieces with boundary together. I'll draw a picture. So here is a torus, and here's a point on the torus, and uh, that's a little neighborhood homeomorphic to R2. And I can take another torus, and here's another point and another neighborhood, 
locally homeomorphic to R2. And I can cut both of these out. So I get these tori, but with little boundary pieces here. And now you can see that these boundaries are homeomorphic. And so if I glue them together, what I get is a genus two surface. This was T2, this was T2, here's T2 minus D2. And this is T2 connect sum T2. So A connect sum B is defined to be the surface obtained by removing R2 neighborhoods of A and B, which are surfaces, and gluing the resulting pieces together. Where by gluing, of course, I mean taking a quotient of the disjoint union. Uh, here is another interesting example. What, what happens if I take the torus and I glue on, I take the connected sum with a sphere? Well, I like cut this disc out and I cut this disc out. So I need to glue this torus piece to now this disc. And as you can see, all it does is replace the disc in the torus I cut out. And so S2, you, you could convince yourself that if you have any surface, connect something with S2 is going to do nothing because you cut out a disc and then you glue back in a disc. So S2 is an identity for the connected sum. And this makes uh, surfaces into what's called a monoid. It has an identity, and you can also see that this connected sum is associative. That structure isn't very deep, but nevertheless, it's interesting to know that it's there. So here's a definition. The connected sum of G T2s, so by this I mean, of course, T2 connect sum, T2 connect sum, T2 G times, is called the orientable surface closed orientable surface of genus G. So these shapes are kind of hard to get a handle on, mainly because they live in this three-dimensional space and it, it can be hard to draw curves on them. Here's a nice property. These spaces can be represented by polygons with gluing information. So let me show you how that works. And first I'll start with a familiar example. So recall this torus, and we've seen this before. If I take this red loop, I take this blue loop, let me call this here A and this here B, then I can cut the surface along the red loop, and I get something that looks like 
the cylinder here. And then I can cut along the blue loop. So these are, let's keep track of their orientation. And if I do that, then I get this square. It's, you take like a, uh, like a tube of toilet paper and if you, if you cut along, you can flatten it out. And there's also gluing instructions for putting this thing back together. It might be easier to go from this square back to the torus. I glue the, the, two the two red lines together so that the arrows agree. And I glue the two blue lines together, labeled B, so that the arrows agree. And I will get my torus. The hard thing to see is that this also works for higher genus shapes. So let me show you the genus two surface, the orientable closed genus two surface. But first, let me just go back to the torus and show you kind of how we get this. So what I do is I, I take a point here and I start tracing around. I'm going to cut out this red and the blue loop and the new boundary is going to be roughly parallel to this green thing I'm going to draw. And what I read is A and so I'm going to come over here to the left and that's A that I read, A. And then I go along B in agreement with its orientation, right? So that's B. And then I'm gonna go along the loop A, but I'm going around it backwards. So I'm moving this way, but I'm, I'm opposing the direction of A. And so I put the arrow going the other way. And then finally, I come along and I do B. But I, of course, again, I'm mismatched with the orientation, so the arrow goes the other way. It's sort of B inverse here. Now let's do this on the genus two surface. So here are my generators of the fundamental group. We'll, we'll see that these actually do generate the fundamental group soon. And it's a little tough to see, but if I cut out the two red loops and the two blue loops, I get a disc. And now let's read off the boundary of this disc so that we can know how to understand this shape as a polygon. So I'm going to start tracing it over in green. Let me copy and paste it just in case it gets a little too messy. Okay, so let's orient all of these. And I'll orient the blue curves going this way. And now let's form this polygon in a similar fashion to before. So uh, I'll trace around, I'll start right here. Let's give these names, A, B, C, and D. And let's see what we come up with. First thing I see is A, and then I see B. Let me keep track of that on my polygon. So first is A in the direction of A, and then B in the direction of B. Now the next thing I see is A going the other way. So it's an A inverse and then a B inverse. So I have a, so this is A, B, and now an A inverse, and then a B inverse. And now I'll see C, D, 
C inverse, D inverse, and then I'm back where I started. So it fills out an octagon. C, D, and then C inverse, and then finally D inverse. And so if I take this octagon and glue it all up, I get this genus two surface. So here's a, a brief picture I uh, took off of Math Stack Exchange. If it doesn't make sense, that's totally fine, but here's what that would look like. And so we can use this to calculate the fundamental group. So by corollary to Van Kempen's theorem, for two complexes, we have generators for every uh, one cell, because here, here are the one cells. This is the graph that forms the one cells and has four cycles here, and, and it's just a wedge of circles. So we got four generators here, and a relation for every two cell. And so in particular here, what's the relation? Well, I mean, this here is the two cell that I glue in, and it's glued along this boundary here, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, C, D, C inverse, D inverse. So recall that the commutator of A and B is given by A, B, A inverse, B inverse. This is a group element that is trivial if A and B happen to commute. It's called the commutator. And so what we get here from this relation is that pi 1 of this genus 2 surface, sigma 2, is equal to Well, I get generators A, B, C, and D. And then again, it was the commutator of A and B times the commutator of C and D is equal to 1. Now, in general, we can do this for a genus G surface. Uh, for example, the graph I would require for the genus 3 surface looks something like, here's the point, and just draw this all in black. I have my three loops cutting the holes this way, Then I also have my three loops coming around this way. And if you trace all around here, you'll get a very similar relation. Now I'm going to get a uh, 12 gon. In general, I'll get a 4G gon. And uh, here's the result in general. The fundamental group of the connected sum of G T2s, which I'll sometimes call sigma g is equal to a1, b1, up until ag, bg, and it's just a single relation, which is the commutator of a1 and b1 times the commutator of a2 and b2, all the way up to the commutator of ag and bg is equal to 1. So here's a hard theorem we won't prove. It, it would be a, an entire class in itself to prove it, but it's a standard result in math, and it's, it underlies a lot of things that happen in modern mathematics. It says that every closed, orientable, 
So closed, I mean no boundary. Orientable, I will define soon. So every closed orientable surface is of the form the connect sum of G T2s for some G. So they all have this very nice form. And here is a nice thing that falls out of that, which we will prove. Closed orientable surfaces are classified by their fundamental groups. What do I mean by that? I mean sigma g is homeomorphic to sigma h if and only if pi 1 of sigma g is equal to pi 1 of sigma h. So let's prove this. So one direction is easy. Uh, and that is this direction. If my two surfaces are homeomorphic, then by the homotopy equivalence invariance of the fundamental group, we have that the fundamental group of sigma g is equal to the fundamental group of sigma h. Homeomorphism is stronger than homotopy equivalence, and we proved that the fundamental group doesn't change under homotopy equivalence. Now let's go the other way. Suppose pi 1 of sigma g is equal to pi 1 of sigma h. Well, then uh, let's abelianize both fundamental groups. So the abelianization of pi 1 of sigma g is the abelianization of the group given by a1, b1, up to ag, bg, so that a1, b1, all the way up to ag, bg, commute. The, the product of all those commutators is 1. So I'm going to abelianize this group, right? Now, in the abelianization, that means I make everything commute. What is the commutator of A and B? Well, this is A, B, A inverse, B inverse. But if I can commute these past each other, then the A will cancel with the A inverse and the B will cancel with the B inverse. So this is just trivial. And so that whole relation is completely redundant. So the relation above is redundant. And so this group has no relations beyond the fact that it is abelian generated by 2G generators. So the abelianization of pi 1 of sigma G is equal to Z to the 2G. Also, by the exact same reasoning, pi 1 of sigma h abelianized comes down to z to the 2h. And this is pretty much it. Since z to the 2g 
is isomorphic to z to the 2h if and only if g, g is equal to h, sigma g is equal to sigma h. They're both the same number of T2s. Great. So that takes care of what's called closed orientable surfaces. Now we get into the stranger surfaces called non-orientable surfaces. So first of all, let me try to give you an intuition for what those are. So in a surface, one can make two choices for the normal vector to a loop. So if I have a sphere here, and I have a loop in the sphere, here colored in red, I can choose this normal vector, n1, or I can choose this normal vector, n2. And here's a question. Can this always be done consistently? Now, what do I mean by done consistently? I mean, does dragging the vector around the loop change the vector? So in this case, on the sphere, we see that it does not. If I take n1 and I take it all the way around the sphere, it comes back to itself, and same thing for n2. Here's a case where that doesn't happen. Consider the Mobius band. So this looks like a band with just a little twist in it. Draw it in the middle here. And if I take a loop here, I claim that there is no consistent normal vector. And to show that, let me just give you the polygon type construction. This is the same thing as I take a strip of paper and I glue the two edges of the paper by a half twist. And that's what this picture represents. So for example, this red point here gets mapped to that red point here, and this blue point here gets mapped to this blue point here. Now let's take a loop in here, and let's look at a normal vector. Well, when I pop out of the right-hand side here, everything's twisted halfway. And so right here, there's a clash. So a loop like this is called an orientation reversing loop. And our definition is going to be a surface is orientable if it does not contain an orientation reversing loop. And on the other hand, if it does, if a surface 
contains uh, an orientation reversing loop. It is called non-orientable. So, for example, the surface RP2, which we've encountered a couple times, is also non-orientable. Let's get at its fundamental group. So recall, RP2 is homeomorphic to S2 mod x is related to negative x, the integral map. And this looks like the sphere here. I'll give it a CW structure with two zero cells and two one cells and two two cells. But all these get squashed. So this used to be E0 and E1. But now this is E0 and E1 is also identified with it. So that's now E0, and we'll call this loop here A. And there's going to be a disk glued onto this one cell here. And the picture is that, that you usually use for the fundamental polygon is this. It goes along. Uh, a once in the in its direction and then uh, it essentially goes over a twice that's that's the idea so RP2 is given by a zero cell union along G a one cell Union along F, a two cell, where, okay, G is uninteresting, is the only possible map. There's only one zero cell, so that one cell has to have both endpoints mapped to that zero cell. And F sends one in the fundamental group of S1 to a squared. And so it's it's essentially like a degree two map. By the previous corollary in last lecture, it's Van Kampen's theorem. For two complexes, we get this proposition which is that pi 1 of RP2 is given by, it's got a single one cell A, and A squared is equal to 1. We know this group well. It's called Z mod 2. Z mod 2Z. And here's another hard theorem. Every closed non-orientable surface I should also say compact. Won't get into what that means, but no infinite type behavior going on. Every compact closed non-orientable surface is homeomorphic to the connected sum of k RP2s for some uh, natural number of k, at least one. So now, if we understand how to do connected sums on RP2, we'll understand the fundamental group of every non-orientable surface. So let's get to that. So since RP2 looks like
this a a let's form a picture in our minds for RP2 connect sum RP2 RP2 connected summed with RP2 looks like so here's one copy of RP2 here's another copy of RP2 I'll call this B and B Now, I want to form the connected sum, so I need to cut disks out of each of these. Let's do that. And then I glue them together. So the way I'm going to imagine this is there's like a little wormhole. If I come in on this side of the wormhole, I pop out over here. And if I come in on this side of the wormhole, I pop out over here. So I've glued these two together. Now let's form our sets for Van Kampen's theorem. So I'm going to take a set A, which is all of one RP2. And also, it's going to come out and poke out a little bit into the other RP2. And I'm also going to take the other set to be essentially symmetric. It's going to be the whole other RP2. And a little bit of our first RP2. So all the red stuff I'm calling A and the blue stuff I'm calling B. Now A intersect B you could think about it like well we're gonna use this green circle here soon make this a little bigger So this green circle here, you can imagine it expand. You can imagine it expand outwards and fill up the whole blue and then expand inwards into that wormhole portal and then finally get into the other side and start filling out the second RP2. So what I've just argued for is that A intersect B is S1 cross I. Uh, A, now, this is a little, it's hard to see pictorially, but it's not hard to see if you think about it abstractly. A is really consisting of a single zero cell and a single one cell. It, everything, uh, Deformation retracts onto that outside. Like all the red stuff pushes out onto the zero cell and the one cell. There's only one of each, and so this must be S1. Well, it's, it's S1 cross I, which is homotopy equivalent to S1. And similarly, B is completely symmetric. It's also S1 cross I. That's kind of interesting. The space is decomposed into three copies of S1 cross I. And so, pi 1 of RP2 connects some RP2 is equal to, I have my generator A and my generator B, and now I need to know when I include this green curve on the left-hand side, what do I get? And when I include it into the right-hand side, the blue set, what do I get? Well, when I include it into the left-hand side, you can see that it expands outwards and it runs around A twice. It follows A on the bottom and then it follows A again on the top. So this is A squared. And then 
I can push it through the wormhole, and here it comes out on the B side, and there it reads B squared. So it's A squared is equal to B squared. And there we have it. That's pi one of RP2 connects some RP2. Now, usually, we, uh, we sub in A1 for A, and A2 inverse for B to get, this is just another presentation of the same group, just with different variables, A1, A2, so that A1 squared, A2 squared is equal to one. And from here, you could just run a simple inductive argument to get the following proposition. Pi one of the connect sum of K RP2s has the presentation A1, A2, all the way up to AK, so that A1 squared, A2 squared, all the way up to AK squared is equal to one. And here is a, another fact, which I won't prove, but you can see it from this decomposition. The abelianization of pi one of the connect sum of K RP twos is Z to the K minus one direct sum Z mod two Z. So that's an abelian group and it happens to be the abelianization here. And note that this is not equal to Z to the two G. So this is not the group of an orientable surface. And here is our final corollary, closed, connected, compact surfaces are classified by their fundamental groups. So that's going to do it for today. I want to say that our final theorem we've derived at is sort of the holy grail of algebraic topology, or rather what algebraic topology strives to be. You take something topological, a surface, and you say, I can calculate this algebraic object on it, and the algebraic object completely determines the surface within the class of surfaces. So if you know you're working with a surface, you don't know which one, but you know how to calculate the fundamental group, you can just do algebra to determine the topology. So that's going to do it for today, and I'll see you guys next time.